Hi, Paul. Hi, Darren. Uh, it's recording. That's bizarre. It is. So we're recording now. Um, so it's a great pleasure today to be welcoming Darren Acosta to give the colloquium here. Um, Darren got his undergraduate degree from the Caltech and then got his PhD in 1989 from UC San Diego. Uh, I first encountered Darren when he was a postdoc at Ohio State University in the mid 90s, where um, when I met him, he was doing gray code for addressing switch capacitor <laughs> arrays and some electronics for CMS, while at the same time doing physics analysis on the Zeus experiment at uh, Daisy in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, he did fantastic work as a postdoc, and on the basis of that, became a professor at University of Florida, where now he's a full professor uh, working on the CMS experiment. And in 2013, he was made a fellow of the American Physical Society, um, uh, DPF, for the work he had done on looking for new physics and lepton quark couplings and compositeness at Hadron Colliders, and also for his efforts leading some of the you know, important technologies that go into the detector, namely with respect to triggering. And he also was deputy coordinator of the physics program on CMS for a while and has continued to have a series of leadership roles on the experiment. He's one of the top people on the CMX, X, CMS experiment in that. And so without further ado, uh, Darren's gonna talk to us about ordering muons off the collider menu. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the kind introduction. And um, thank you for the invitation, everyone. And glad everyone's able to connect. That means you have power at least where you are. <laughs> My sympathies. Okay, um, this is not an image of Florida. Uh, this is a picture of the CERN globe at uh, the laboratory CERN overseas, where most of this story will take place. Um, here's just a general outline of my talk. So I will give you just a brief overview of what is particle physics, and then drill into the Large Hadron Collider and the CMS experiment that I'm a part of. I'll explain to you uh, what a trigger menu is. <laughs> it's part oh, of- Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to tell people, um, Feel free to interrupt. I discuss with Darren. If you have mm -hmm. questions, interrupt him. Yep. Sounds good. Right. Um, and then after that, so most of this talk will, on the physics content, focus on the Higgs boson. Um, it was discovered uh, in 2012. I'll just brief overview of that. And that in 2018, we discovered it's coupling to third generation fermi fermions. One of the main needs is the search for its coupling to second generation fermions, a lighter form of uh, fermion matter, fermionic matter. Um, round out with a, a few searches for possible Z prime bosons that are very much in the same sort of final state. And then a little bit about, a little bit about what's coming uh, beyond in the next LHC run and further upgrades and even longer term, uh, including new colliders. So uh, what is particle physics? If, in case you didn't know already, so generally the field uh, concerns itself with the constituents of matter and the fundamental forces by which they interact. So for example, in the past century, we've gone from atoms as the fundamental entity to electrons and nuclei and the nuclei themselves and broken down into protons and neutrons, which in turn are comprised of quarks uh, in this like simple animation to the right. Um, we also now have, uh, starting from the last century, quantum field theories for the electroweak force, which has been combined, the electromagnetism and weak nuclear forces, the strong nuclear force, but not yet uh, such a theory for gravity. And the first two, electroweak and strong nuclear force, form what is known as the standard model of particle physics. So what are the players in the standard model, the particles? So there's a, a table here, canonical table, and you can break it down uh, the top uh, uh, left corner are the quarks. The lightest form are the up and down quarks that form protons and neutrons. Then there's the electron and its neutral counterpart, the electron neutrino. These, these are the leptons. And in addition, we have the carriers of the forces. So there's been a second quantization. Electromagnetism has a photon as a propagator, the, the weak force, the W and Z bosons, and there's a gluon for the strong force. And newly discovered in the last eight years or so, an, uh, a new particle of the only fundamental scalar particle known as the Higgs boson. 
But there are some unanswered questions, maybe many unanswered questions that remain. One is, matter seems to be replicated three times. So I just highlighted the first column of these particles, the first generation of fermions. Um, but as Isidore Robbie exclaimed, you know, who ordered that when the muon was discovered, which is, forms part of the second generation, a heavier copy of the electron. Similarly for the quarks, there's a charm and strange quark. And there's also a third generation. There's also a wide range of masses. Neutrinos have a mass uh, below an electron volt generally, but yet the heaviest quark, the top quark has a mass of 170 GeV nearly or more than 170 times the mass of the proton. Now we don't have explanations for that. This is sort of generally the field of flavor physics. And the quarks and leptons are related, but how? Uh, in particular, we know atoms are neutral. Protons made of quarks and also has electrons for the atom and those exactly balanced electric charge, but we don't really have an explanation. That's just an ingredient into the theory. And one might also ask, well, are the strong and electroweak forces related? In particular, their gauge coupling constants seem to converge at very high energies, perhaps indicating a grand unified theory of which also might incorporate quarks and leptons in equal footing. And finally, does this even comprise all the forms of matter and all the forces that are in our physical universe? In particular, we now know there is dark matter when we look out in the universe. There's astrophysical and cosmological evidence for dark matter, um, which is essentially non-baryonic matter, not directly seen. The evidence originally stemmed from galactic rotation curves, which indicated more mass at large radii from the center of galaxies than could be accounted for in stars. But also you can essentially image it from inferring the mass along the line of sight from gravitational lensing, like this um, image here, showing very distorted views of distant galaxies because of the matter between us and them that's bending the light. And so the focus of um, experimental particle physics on the subject say of dark matter or any of these particles is, well, can we produce it in the lab, i.e. via collider? So speaking of that, moving on to colliders, let me introduce for you the CERN Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. Um, so here's just a, a photograph with the, roughly the size of the LHC superimposed on the countryside around Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, the Alps are kind of in the distant background there, the Mont Blanc there, Geneva would be somewhere just in the foreground of the Alps. Uh, the CERN laboratory near the Geneva airport and then underground, so not above, so that's why I highlighted here, would be this, um, this circular accelerator. It's a 27 kilometer proton-proton collider and also a heavy ion collider and it's near Geneva, Switzerland. Um, it accelerates the protons up to six and a half TeV beam energy. It's designed for up to seven, so we're nearly there and we may get there next year. And it has two proton rings uh, where the protons circulate in opposite directions and are brought into collision. To get the protons to circulate around this circular ring requires uh, magnetic fields. So there are 1,232 superconducting uh, 8.4 Tesla dipole magnets cooled down to less than two degrees Kelvin. So this forms the world's largest cryogenic structure actually. And there are four major experiments um, on the LHC. There is ATLAS and CMS kind of diametrically opposed across the ring, CMS being on the top here, uh, but actually farthest from the CERN cafeteria down here where ATLAS is. Those are very general purpose experiments. And then there's two other ones, ELISE and LHCB, which are specialized, one for heavy ion collisions and one for um, heavy flavor matter in the, in the forward directions. First collisions of this machine began in 2009 and the last data run known as run two completed in 2018 at a center of mass energy of 13 TV. We are currently in a three year maintenance and upgrade period with a restart next year, early 2022. So uh, um, I'm a member of the CMS experiment. Uh, CMS stands for the compact muon solenoid. Compact's a relative term here uh, you can see kind of a canonical figure here for a person, uh, but basically the experiment is something like 15 meters in height and uh, probably three times that in length. Uh, one of the salient features is it's got a very powerful and very large superconducting solenoid magnet of up to nearly four Tesla in field strength with most of the instrumentation inside that magnet. 
Now these instrumentation form layers around the collision point, which would be in the center of this diagram. And they help measure the energies and momentum of particles that emanate from the collision. Um, we can't tell quantum mechanics what particle to give us. So we need to reconstruct all of the uh, collision products to be able to infer what process or processes took place. And this is a large experiment, um, but it's designed for a broad range of physics. So it's, it's a very general purpose experiment. You can think of it kind of like a telescope if we're looking out in the universe, you can do lots of science with this instrument. If I focus just on the outermost layers of this instrumentation onion, pull back just the first layers, that's the muon system. Uh, well, actually, let me show a picture first. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is a picture of the diagram now in reality, what the experiment looks like. That nearly four Tesla magnet, sound like magnet shown here on the left. Um, with the experiment opened up. This is the central barrel part of the experiment. Um, and then out here, these were muon detectors, that outermost layer of instrumentation, um, basically several rings on just one of the disks of, of about eight disks, or exactly eight disks. And the beam line is going through the center. So this is experiment pulled apart uh, so that it can be accessed and, and, and uh, either maintained or, or refurbished. But yes, uh, starting from the outer layer, uh, the muon system, since this is a talk that's gonna involve muons, I should <laughs> explain how we detect them. We actually have three technologies of detectors to measure muons. Uh, they're all gaseous detectors. Uh, there are drift tubes, cathode strip chambers, and resistive, resistive plate chambers. The last one does not use um, wire electrodes. Uh, the first two do. I won't go into more details about them other than to say that as they cover the outermost layers, they have to cover a lot of uh, surface area, 25,000 square meters of active detection planes, where at least for two of those systems, we're trying to measure positions of muons down to 100 microns. So very fine precision over a very large area uh, with about a million electronic channels. Uh, the central one here, the cathode strip chamber system, comprises of 540 large chambers. These are each about three meters long on the largest ones. And I put a flag here because this is one of the flagship efforts of the US groups. Uh, we weren't the only country contributing, but this was one of our predominant detector contributions for the construction. And uh, in fact, RICE has been involved uh, with this system. But that's not the only system. Uh, if I work the other way around from the core of the of instrumentation very close to the collision point, these are instruments that can actually fit on a tabletop. Uh, there are the pixel systems, the barrel pixels shown here above, at least in a slice, a cutaway, half, half of one side of it. And in the forward region, there's a the forward pixel systems. Uh, this is another flagship effort of the US groups and also of RICE in particular. Uh, they're involved at the basically the, this particular system's design and, and maintenance and reconstruction. Then um, completing, this is the innermost layers of silicon tracking detectors to measure trajectories of charged particles. There's some uh, layers that are larger radii. Those are known as silicon strip modules. And then there are instruments called calorimeters which stop particles and basically measure their energies. Uh, crystal calorimeters, and then there's a hadron calorimeter outside of uh, the crystals. Uh, and the Hadron Kilometer was yet one more of these American flagship uh, efforts uh, for the original construction. But again, there are other countries involved. And in fact, the US involved in all these systems. I'm just highlighting where a large chunk of the effort and, and funds went. But not shown in those detector images are the electronics and computers to selectively read out their data, meaning the detector's data. This forms the data acquisition and trigger system. Okay, why do we need a real-time data selection system known as a trigger? Well, it turns out that all those detectors I briefly showed you um, stream out too much data. They would continuously stream out too much data for storage and or computer processing reasons. Uh, the LHC collides proton bunches, where a bunch is something like a 10th of a trillion protons at 40 megahertz, 40 million times a second. And that would stream out from our experiment something of the order of 100 terabytes per second. And um, I like to explain this to my graduate students that we need a trigger system, otherwise they're not gonna be able to graduate uh, <laughs> in five or six years. It might be decades if we had to analyze all of that data. Um, so that's what the trigger system does. It has to somehow reduce the amount of data to storage 
And it's really the first step of any, of any data analysis at this experiment. It's an online data filtering system where we are selecting the collisions we want most for our studies, but it's irreversible. You can't go back and study data you did not record. Uh, so we have to throw away, it turns out, 99.998% of all of the LHC beam crossings, keeping only about 1,000 hertz in rate of the 40 megahertz beam crossing rate. But we have to do so very carefully because we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, which means where the baby, for example, could be a Higgs boson. So it has to be very selective. To do so, this trigger system um, has a, an architecture that's broken down into two levels. The first is known as level one, and on the diagram on the right, it's taking the full onslaught of data at 40 megahertz, at least a subset of data with some reduced precision. And to keep up with that rate, it's using a custom electronics uh, system to reduce the rate from 40 megahertz to no more than 100 kilohertz, um, which is then uh, manageable by the rest of the detector electronics. But it only has four microseconds to do that processing, and that's limited by essentially memory depth. Then there's a second level known as the high level trigger. And this is uh, known as an event filter, filter firm comprised of commercial CPUs. And now soon for the next running next year, even GPUs for the general processing that's running software to further reduce the event rate to storage to an order to an average rate of about a kilohertz. Uh, that was the case for the previous LHC running. And it's doing so with an order of 26,000 CPU cores. You might ask why break up the trigger into two levels? And uh, so my analogy to borrow from both Texas and Florida is it's just more cost-effective with multiple stages. So if I take borrow from the, um, from the aerospace industry, sending rockets, satellites to orbits with rockets, uh, it's a <laughs> much more effective to do that with multiple stages than with one, uh, just because of the weight that you would have to lift up. So it's just more cost-effective to do so. Now, let me give you just one example of part of that trigger system known as the NCAP muon track finder. It's part of the level one trigger system to identify muons in the NCAP regions of the experiment. The experiment you can kind of think of as a, as a cylinder, a solid cylinder with two ends at each, and, and we're talking about the muon systems there. And it has to measure the momentum. We do so with this system here. You know, it's not so large. It's, it's fitting an electronic rack with one of our postdoctoral scientists there. And what's in there are 12 custom processor modules uh, designed by my group housed in two uh, crates here. It's processing muon data in about half a microsecond. And it's implementing the logic in something known as field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. Um, so basically, it's a way to get even lower level than CPUs to do um, very parallel algorithms. So it's very fast. It's also using a gigabyte of memory per card for momentum assignment where the momentum assignment is actually using machine learning. Uh, it's been trained using an algorithm called a boosted decision tree. And one card, if I pulled it out of the crate and unplugged all the optical fibers that are going into it would look roughly like it. Rather compact, but still rather, rather busy. So um, just a comment about selecting your data. Um, how do I know what data to select? Well, that's up to your physics analysis. And what you need gets into what is known as a trigger menu. So these are the menus of the top. The trigger menu represents a large set of selection criteria for the broad physics program of the experiment. For example, to give just two examples, let's say entree one on the menu is asking for two muons, opposite electric charge, one with a momentum above 17 GV and one with a momentum above 8 GV. That's an example item on the menu. Entree two might be asking for jets, which are collimated sprays of particles, with a total scalar transverse momentum above 500 GV. But there's more than that. Crudely speaking, there's about one trigger, trigger line or trigger entree here per analysis topic. Some of those triggers are very general and serve many analyses and that's our preference so that we're open to a broad range of physics, even topics we haven't thought of yet. But some are very specific just to meet the data processing challenges and storage challenges. And some are kind of backup triggers for specialized control regions for some analyses. We have separate menus for that first level one system and then the subsequent high level trigger. 
And the level one has about 300 menu items and the high level trigger about 600 menu items. And one of my jobs as trigger coordinator is we're kind of managing the implementation of these menus, studying their performance and, and making sure that all runs in the, the amount of CPU time that we have available. However, now that I've told you what a trigger is, <laughs> let me tell you about some other current ideas just as an aside. We actually have efforts to go trigger less where we would try to keep all of the collisions, all of the events, but only store a selective fraction of the data per event. So that's another way to meet the data storage challenge. Um, and so that is something we've uh, pioneered uh, as well as other experiments uh, in the last LHC run. And, and we're gonna go and do that again in the upcoming runs. But okay, let's go on to the physics program. Um, first of all, it's a broad physics program, as I said. So the CMS collaboration reached a milestone late last year and it published its thousandth scientific journal article since 2009. And recently our rate has been about 100, more than 100 publications um, published per year. Broad coverage of physics areas. This is a chart of different broad areas. The blue is search for kind of exotic physics. That's kind of where the bulk of the papers are going. Each one kind of a special model that we're studying. Uh, or we're studying the standard model itself. That standard model itself. Those are the orange lines here, or the the red for the Higgs boson, and then other new physics like supersymmetry. That's a lot of papers, a lot of science. I can only give you the smallest of samplings uh, in this talk. So, uh, just to explain that. So, and that sampling is mostly going to be concentrated on the Higgs boson. So, the excitement in 2012 was that nearly 50 years after its proposal, the Higgs boson was discovered in its coupling to uh, the gauge bosons in 2012. On the left is kind of a uh, idealized image or at least uh, enhanced graphics image, I guess, of the signal in its Higgs decay to photons, the carrier of the electric magnetic, electromagnetic force. Um, and then also on the right is a peak that you'll see growing here for the Higgs decay into two Z bosons. They're like heavy photons going into four leptons. And that was, um, those were the two main channels that led to the discovery. It also led to the 2013 Nobel Prize for Francois, Francois Aglert and uh, Peter Higgs. But at that time, uh, the, establishing the Higgs coupling of fermions was not yet confirmed. Now, just, in a, just some information uh, about the Higgs field and uh, the Higgs boson. This was introduced to the standard model Lagrangian uh, uh, what was introduced was a complex scalar field phi. It's a weak isospin doublet. And with spontaneous symmetry breaking, the potential of this field takes an inverted shape shown here. And that can be achieved by this potential shown here with uh, basically a quadratic term and a quartic term on the field with parameters mu squared and lambda in front of uh, each uh, respectively. And if you let the mu squared be uh, negative, you can get this inverted shape where the minimum of the potential is not uh, at an average expectation of zero field. There is some field of value permeating the universe. And that non-zero vacuum, vacuum expectation value um, uh, through uh, the interactions with that field uh, gives mass to the W and Z bosons. That was the original brout englert higgs mechanism um, to make those particles massive, unlike the photon. And also in the standard model, we introduced trilinear couplings of the Higgs uh, field with fermions in proportion to their mass to explain that. And as a consequence, it gave rise to its own particle, a scalar boson as a result. That boson, as I said, was discovered. It's at a mass of 125 GeV, uh, which is interesting because it's on the boundary between a stable and metastable electroweak vacuum state. But that basically is indicating that there could be new physics at an intermediate mass scale below uh, what's known as the grand unification scale of 10 to the 16 GeV. So maybe it's a hint of something. Now the Higgs boson has a rich uh, set of decays. It does couple to mass, so it couples to heavy things more, more prominently than to light things. And so the cleanest channels, like for the discovery channels, were into the bosons, like uh, two, Z lept, two Z bosons or two W bosons or two photons. But another clean one is its decay into two muons. These are clean in the terms of experimental reconstruction, as I'll explain later. Uh, this is a chart showing these branching fractions, which is the probability for the decay on a log plot, where I've highlighted 125 GV. And where that 
Higgs boson's mass landed actually gives us this wide range of all of these possible decays we can explore. Um, it could have been somewhere else and it would have been predominantly, you know, say WW and ZZ only. Um, and we did find it. The LHC was designed to find the Higgs and, and ultimately found it. But I think what has been unappreciated and maybe our field did a disservice was after discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, 2018 was also a rather important year where we established the Higgs boson coupling to those fermions, at least to the third generation heaviest fermions, confirming that that Higgs field is also the same field interacting with the fermions. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of that, um, that uh, discovery of the fermionic couplings. I'm not going to go into great details here. I'll save a little bit more uh, for the second generation. But uh, there were uh, basically three main channels, uh, decays, I should say, of the Higgs boson. One is its decay to bottom quarks. That's actually the dominant decay channel, of nearly 60% of Higgs decays. But experimentally, it's very difficult to isolate um, these bottom quarks from all the other types of particles produced by the LHC. In fact, it produces a lot of bottom quarks. Uh, this mainly was done in the so-called associated production with a vector boson, and that's shown by a diagram here. So you can imagine a quark and an antiquark from the two protons that are colliding, creating a, a W or a Z boson, which radiates off a Higgs boson. So there's a W or Z in association with the Higgs, where the Higgs decays into bottom and anti-bottom quark. Um, to do this analysis, since it is hard to isolate, requires throwing everything at it. Uh, so you'll see in red here, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. We're really trying to extract as much information content as we can, taking advantage of uh, new instrumentation. A new pixel detector was installed in 2017, um, using neural networks to improve on the regression of the DiJet mass to figure out the mass of the Higgs boson. And so we can see these curves on the right uh, that get sharper the more uh, features or more um, improvements to the algorithms we put in. And then ultimately there was a neural net discriminant to uh, train to find that signal over background. And the end result, um, if I could just concentrate, when we combine all the production modes, not just the associated production with the uh, vector boson, but also gluon fusion and so-called vector boson fusion and production with top quarks, and I'll say more about these in a bit later, is that we saw a significance of a signal of over five standard deviations, both observed and expected, where five standard deviations is the, the criterion our field has uh, if you want to claim a discovery. Uh, the measurement of this coupling, turning it around that you've discovered it and how, uh, how does the Higgs couple to the bottom quarks? Is it as we expect? Uh, we measure something called mu, which is really just the ratio of the yield that we measure to the ratio expected in the in this standard model, that collection of theories. And the result is consistent with one, 1 1.04 plus or minus uh, 0.14 actually squared and squared root because there's statistical and systematic errors. Um, we've also seen the coupling of the Higgs to top quarks. Um, now, um, we can't actually have the Higgs decay to top quarks because the top is the heaviest particle. So that would violate energy conservation. So we can only produce the Higgs in association with two Higgs part, two, sorry, two top quarks. That uh, takes a lot of energy. So this is a rare type of uh, collision that produces this. And, uh, but very interesting uh, final state. There's um, uh, lots of uh, jets coming either from the top quark decay to a bottom quark or from one of the W bosons decaying uh, to quarks from the top decay. And you can look at the Higgs decay, not only to B jets, but also many other possible decay states um, like the original W and Z boson decay or photons. In, in the end, 88 different final state topologies were analyzed uh, for this measurement that was published here. And again, you can imagine pervasive use of deep neural nets to maximize the information extraction. And if you kind of categorized uh, what we saw versus what we, if it, the Higgs were not there, um, this is kind of a plot of basically the output of that machine learning organized by signal over background. So very high signal background sensitivity on the far right. And you can start to see an excess in the curve above. If you subtract off um, the background only expectation, you can sort of see that excess and it's about what you expected. And um, on the next slide here, just saying, uh, combining both the last LHC running period and the very first running period, 
we can get over that five standard deviation um, threshold to claim discovery. And we have a best fit to the coupling to top quarks, which is consistent with one, uh, at least within uh, one error bar or one standard deviation. And then finally, to round out the third generation, there are also the leptons. Um, we're not going to see it in the uh, decay in the neutrinos directly, but we can see it in the tau leptons, which are electrically charged. That branching fraction is 6%, so it's not too small. It's not huge, but it's not too small. You can look at the tau lepton, which does promptly decay. Um, so it, you're going to see it in its final states, which can involve the other charged leptons, electron muons, and then not shown are going to be neutrinos. And again, an observed significance well above five standard deviations was seen. Um, on the right is kind of the reconstructed invariant mass of the, uh, the di lepton, sorry, di tau final state. Um, we're looking at the excess in red on this histogram here, and there's various backgrounds in the colored histograms. But if you subtract off the non Higgs backgrounds, you get the inset here, and you can see a broad bump, kind of consistent with 125 GeV. And the coupling was consistent with 1.85 here with an error bar basically of one standard deviation from one. Okay, that was just rounding out the third generation fermions. But what has been new in the last year is the search, well, at least results, interesting results from the search for the coupling to second generation fermions via muons. Um, so we want to probe the coupling of Higgs bosons to the second generation fermions. It should be, this coupling should be in proportion to the mass of the particles decaying to. If we plot on this uh, sort of log-log plot, the particle mass that Higgs boson uh, couples to versus that coupling on the vertical axis, we can see the heaviest particles on the right, like I just showed you here, the top quark, the W and Z, the bottom and tau, and they fall along this expected line uh, going down. And the question is what's happening down at very lighter, uh, much lighter masses where the muon is at 0.1 GeV? What's happening there? But since it is such a small coupling, it, it, you're going to need more data. That branching fraction is only 2 times 10 to the minus 4, a very tiny slice of the overall rich topology of decays that the Higgs boson can have. But it is an interesting and clean signature. We're looking for a narrow width resonance on top of a smoothly falling background. It's only limited by how well we reconstruct the mass experimentally. The theoretical width is much narrower. Um, and its dominant backgrounds are so-called drill yen production of uh, Z or uh, photon uh, production, well, dilepton production via Z or photons and top anti-top production. Darren, may I ask a question of clarification? Sure. So, so to what extent do we know the branching ratios and the those couplings of the bosons to the fermions? I guess to preempt my question, I mean, usually when we think of standard model, people typically quote the the gauge symmetries and the representations for the particles, but the reality is that there is something of the order of 18 or 26, I don't remember, different parameters in the standard model that are not predicted by theory. They're free parameters. So are the coupling of the Higgs to, let's say, a top or bottom quark or, you know, strange quark, are, are those one of those free parameters that in principle could be anything? And if that's the case, you know, how do we know that that coupling should be proportional to the mass of the quark? Well, um, so in the end, you're, you're, I mean, it, to me, maybe it's slightly circular, right? Because, uh, you know, we, we have a coupling to particles in proportional to mass. We know the, the, the K particles mass very well. Um, as far as the theory itself, yes, there's going to be some uncertainty. I think it's quite small, actually, compared to the numbers we're using uh, theoretically on these branching fractions. But I, yeah, there, I'm sure there is uh, an uncertainty there from other theoretical uncertainties, but I don't think it's very large. I'd have to look up again what the actual branching fraction uncertainty is, but I think it's smaller than the stated precisions listed here. I see. So, so, so the cross section would be something that's more uncertain, for example, how many Higgs bosons we make. I see. But I see. So, th so that so depends on the content of the proton and, and how well that's pinned down at these masses and I energies. See. And so, sort of conceptually speaking, if you, if one looks at what happened to the standard model since 2012, since Higgs was discovered, you know, would you say that those parameters, those couplings to the quarks, 
they kind of panned out for what people expected them to be or have the experimental measurements at you know cms and atlas have they helped put bounds on those parameters i'm just trying to get a sense for what theorists thought let's say 50 years ago when they thought about how higgs would couple to quarks how close is it to what actually was measured yeah that in some sense that's um uh this fit in the top right uh, graph I, I would say at the moment the error bars uh are still the experimental error bars are, are dominating actually it's probably better to look at the inset below which uh, takes out the slope and just shows the differences uh things are consistent with the experimental errors but that's kind of one of the points is to measure these ever more finely to start to see if we do see deviations i would say we're not quite there at least in terms of these coupling measurements um, some things like the spin measurement of the Higgs is, is known much more precisely and we're, we're pretty certain it's a scalar boson. But the actual coupling to mass, um, you know, we're still limited by the uncertainties which are a combination in some cases statistical like the channel I'm going to show you. But in some cases, uh, like the bottom quark, probably a lot of systematic uncertainty which is going to be harder to, to reduce. These are the experimental uncertainties that in some sense don't depend so much on how much data you've collected. They're like how well you've calibrated the detector or separated background. So I, I don't think we're there yet, um, but uh, certainly if we had seen coupling significantly off experimentally, then that would have been interesting. And that's why I was interested in looking in the search for dimuons is what if we found the coupling of muons at the same level as the tau lepton? It could be that maybe there was lepton universality, but that's not what the standard model is predicting. Um, and so actually for me, the interesting stuff was as the, we, our limits were getting lower and lower, it's like, okay, we're ruling out more and more phase space for uh, something different. But I think, I think the answer is we're, we're still experimentally limited. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, um, so essentially for this search, um, we're looking for Higgs decaying to two muons and those are both measurable by the muon system. So we're looking for a peak in the dimuon spectrum. And uh, I like to remind my, uh, my students that you have to use some relativity here. Uh, you take the total energy of your product, square it, subtract off the total momentum uh, squared, and that gives you the mass squared. And if you plot that, and this is on a log mass plot, you get this really interesting diagram here. Uh, I'll say more about that in a second, but we're basically looking for an extra bump, an extra feature on this at about at, at exactly 125 GeV, a small narrow peak on a falling Julian resonance, Julian being this overall continuum spectrum with the Z boson there. And it's an interesting plot because it's illustrating several Nobel Prize discoveries. The Psi mesons, those are the, that's the charm quark uh, discovery. The Upsilon resonances is the bottom quark discovery. Uh, the Z boson, the carrier of the neutral uh, weak force, you know, there's a discovery uh, from back in the day. And um, so it's kind of neat. And so, um, well, we, eventually we should be able to show that peak here on this plot. Um, and one kind of experimental thing to note is the, the Upsilon particles, there's three resonances that you can reconstruct and actually CMS has a strong enough magnet and a good enough tracking system to resolve all three peaks. Uh, two of them are kind of close you can see, but we can resolve them. And that's gonna be key for this search be able to resolve things like that at that fine precision. And just as an aside, um, because I've run our QuarkNet Center here, um, the data for this plot, at least a, a subset of it is uh, open data. In fact, CERN publishes a lot of open data for science and for the public. And if you wanna make a plot similar to that, um, you can go, for example, use, run it on Google Colab. And uh, I have a link here if you're interested or just let me know. Now, if we're looking for this decay, since the Higgs boson was discovered, we're not looking just anywhere. We we're looking at where the mass where the Higgs boson was discovered. And so what is the most precise measurement we have of that? That's coming from its decay into diphotons and to the uh, two Z bosons, one of which is virtual. And so, you know, you can fit these peaks effectively. Of course, you're gonna do something more sophisticated to work out the mass of this peak and that's what's done here from different runs and different final states. But the bottom line is we've measured the mass to be at CMS uh, in this article here, 125.38 GV with these error bars and those error bars amount to about 0.18 GV, which is 0.14% precision. 
So we do know the mass pretty precisely. And so we want to look at that mass in the Daimyeon peak to see if we see anything. To do the search, um, you look at all the ways you can produce the Higgs boson, and then you look specifically for the decay of the Higgs boson into two, two muons. Uh, so I just reviewed to you, for example, the associated production of a Higgs boson with a vector boson uh, in the BB bar um, final state. There was also the association with top quarks. Uh, two other ones are, for example, what's called vector boson fusion, where two vector bosons fuse to make a Higgs. And then there's just general gluon fusion to make a Higgs. That's actually the largest cross section. I'm mostly just going to highlight, and for reasons you'll see in a moment, just this mode, the associated production. But I will say briefly something about the others, just given the time. And long story short, before I go into some details, we design categories to select those different production modes with the Higgs decaying the dimuons. These colors are basically showing that for the different four different uh, production categories I showed you, that the colors correspond to that the selection of that mode is matching <laughs> what we expected. Uh, pure gluon fusion for the blue case, vector boson fusion for the green case, and so on. But to actually see this coupling, that's not necessarily um, all, all production modes are equal. Um, the highest purity, meaning best, most signal to background, you see are kind of the lower three production channels, not the gluon fusion. But the highest sensitivity is including gluon fusion and this vector boson fusion and a little bit coming from associate production top pair. And that's because most of the cross-section is in this gluon fusion. And so that's going to give you the most Higgs bosons. So you have to do analysis and select objects in your data to try to reconstruct exactly that decay. Um, you're looking for muons. And I won't go over the detailed lists here unless there are questions. But we're basically requiring two oppositely charged energetic muons. So you have to have significant momentum for the Higgs boson candidate. And then depending on your production topology, we're selecting other objects, perhaps electrons, uh, in addition from vector boson decays or from top quark decays, jets, which are sprays of particles from quarks and gluons. Um, and then in the case of top quark production decaying the B quarks, uh, so-called B tag jets. But I'm just gonna concentrate on the associated production channel, mostly because that was the PhD topic of my student. Uh, Shunwul here, who's uh, set to dis defend later this semester. And basically, he's looking for the associate production of the Higgs and the Tumions with another gauge boson, where that gauge boson decays either to one or two extra leptons. If it's one lepton for the W boson and two for the Z boson. And then actually no jets, no B tag jets. Um, and to do the analysis, um, as you've seen a theme, <laughs> to throw everything you have at it, machine learning, uh, boosted decision trees to make categories for better signal to background discrimination, and also using our experimental mass resolution as a, uh, a weight uh, in that training. So the best measured events get the most weight. And we've done that with categories, uh, basically the most uh, signal-like categories on the far right of these plots. And you're gonna be looking for excesses at the far side uh, there. The bottom is just kind of the background subtractive difference, which is not very evident at, uh, just at, as a whole there, integrated overall masses. But there were other channels. This analysis, to, or sorry, this uh, decay requires looking at all the production modes. So the inclusive gluon fusion mode, but I will skip those details, but they are there. Uh, this production of the Higgs with top quarks, a much more complicated analysis because of all the possible final state particles. Let's uh, <laughs> skip those details for now. And the vector boson fusion channel where you have the vector bosons fusing to make a Higgs, but that leads to forward jets. Um, there's some picture here showing that, but we'll skip that and just give you the final result. So on the right, the top plot is showing that mass distribution, the invariant mass of the two muons. Um, and you see a nice smooth curve here. That's, and this is weighted by signal to background effectively. And well, you can't really see much peak, but if you subtract the background, you will see in the region you want to look at 125.38, yeah, there's a consecutive number of data points which are high and you could kind of fit that in fact, we fit that done a little bit more complexly, um, that there's some evidence of something there. Um, we can look at a production channel by production channel. 
Um, you can see you know, some excess here in the ordinary gluon fusion case, the, the dominant production mode, a little less than the other ones. Uh, you'll get to see some in this vector boson fusion mode, uh, but together showed that evidence. And so how significant was it? Um, this is a plot of what's called the p-value, but you can think of it as the probability for the pure background without a Higgs boson, at least decaying the Higgs to dimuons, to fluctuate to a signal that you've seen or larger. And at the best Higgs mass measurement of 125.38, so I draw an arrow there, we can look at the black curve, which is combining all the production modes. And we just touch this dotted line here, which is a probability corresponding to three standard deviations. Uh, where we expected about two and a half. And greater than three standard deviations is our canonical uh, threshold that required our field to claim evidence for some something to happen, for this decay to happen. So we can't say we've discovered it at five standard deviations, but we have uh, rights to say evidence. So that was exciting. So that's the first hints now of this mode. And we can talk about how well we've measured um, that coupling to, to muons. And it's consistent with one, the ratio, this ratio mu to the standard model expectation. It's about 1.2 with an error bar of about 0.4. So quite consistent with that. These are the different production channels and how they contribute to mu. Um, and we can compare that to now say our competitor. There's the other general purpose experiment across the ring, the Atlas experiment. They've done the same analysis. They came up as far as a measurement, 1.2, but with larger error bars, plus or minus 0.6. But that's, it's, that's quite consistent, so that's good. <laughs> We've both sort of seen the same thing, right? In fact, too good, right? 1.2, even despite the large error bars. But their significance is only two standard deviations, not three. And that's less than CMS. Um, I'd like to say it's because we're just better, <laughs> but it's actually, there's a reason for this. It's primarily from that mass resolution. Atlas has a two Tesla solenoidal magnet. We have four. So we have an inherent advantage of, of sharper resolution, which lets us see this signal, should in principle let us see the signal before them in terms of the amount of data taken. So that was, that was nice for us. <laughs> and how does that line up on the Higgs coupling? What we were talking about earlier. So adding to the plot, the, the measurement for the coupling to muons, it is lined along this diagonal line here on this log log plot. If you linearize it, you see within the error bars, everything's quite consistent with what was expected from the standard model, which is good. It tells us that this seems to be the Higgs boson that was always envisioned. Maybe bad if you're looking for something different, something not ordered, but okay. Um, again, with more and more data, we'll be able to narrow the error bars and we'll see if the story continues to hold. Um, there is another second generation or more, more than one, but uh, other second generation particles. Uh, one of them is the charm quark. Um, just one brief slide about that. It's got a larger branching fraction than for muons. It's nearly 3% instead of point or two times 10 minus four. But this is even more experimentally challenging than Higgs to bottom quarks. Um, nevertheless, CMS published an analysis looking for this. We've set a limit uh, sort of at the level of 50 times the standard model, but it has to be less than that. So you can see we have a long ways to go to get down to the standard model level. So the muon was really our, our most realistic chance to see the coupling to second generation. Now, just uh, briefly changing gears and I'll do so um, just briefly. So I'm just gonna leave Higgs now um, and talk about just dileptons because it's such a, in principle, simple analysis looking for resonance in two leptons. And with a high energy cloud, you're kind of obligated to look for signatures at the very highest masses, potentially of new gauge bosons at the high energy frontier. Perhaps there is a new force giving rise to a Z prime boson with couplings like the Z boson, or, or maybe they're different, of course. So you can look. So this is um, a log plot selecting either di electrons or di muons. Um, going up to, you can see several thousands of GeV. Um, actually, it's up to about three TeV as far as the data points are reaching out to about three TeV in both dielectrons and dimuons. Sadly, it seems to agree exactly with what we expect on this nice long continuous tail, no peaks showing up. So we can only set limits. And so we can take these models of possible new Z primes and it depends on the model, whether it has exactly the standard model coupling, but a different mass 
or perhaps some other model. And there's a whole infinite range in principle. But you can see we're kind of probing out to the four and a half, five TeV masses for new bosons that make resonances. And these are the actual limits here. Um, observe five for the standard sequential model, standard model, sequential standard model, sorry, uh, Z prime or for other models. Um, you might ask, well, what about lower mass? Uh, of course, that's kind of a strange question because I just showed you lower mass. But did we miss anything at lower energies? Are there very weak couplings so that the amount of data we get of a resonant at lower mass is, is rather, rather small? And so we could look, look for such evidence of, of very light Z primes in the decays of other bosons, either the Z boson itself um, or even the Higgs boson. So that was done too. Let me just highlight one of them from CMS, uh, a search for a particular type of Z prime. Uh, this Z prime uh, is arising from a particular local gauge symmetry um, called L mu, well, basically involving the muon and tau lepton numbers, U1 local gauge symmetry. This particular model can explain some anomalies that have been observed, um, potentially observed in the muon G minus two measurement and in B meson decays where it seems like there might be uh, lepton flavor violation, at least in the tau component. So you have a model here that only couples to muon and tau leptons and nothing else. The idea is to look for resonances, therefore, um, from the Z prime decaying to dileptons, but at lower masses. This is masses, say, from 45 to 70 GV, but you can also look down to 5 GV and above. But the data points are kind of continuous, not really high, showing much of anything. We can only set limits. Uh, so this is limits on the coupling versus the mass on a log scale starting from yes, about 5 GV and going up to uh, about 70 GV. And we're starting to rule out the open territory that was allowed uh, by that anomaly. Okay, uh, so in the brief remaining time, let me just indicate some future directions. Uh, where are we going? Um, so first of all, this is maybe too busy a schedule, but I'll just highlight a few things about the LHC and, and its upgrades. So on this timeline, we are here at the red arrow, year 2021. Um, next year, 2022, we'll begin a new, uh, at least three year uh, data run called run three. We hope to increase the center mass energy slightly from 13 TV to 14 TV. Um, and we'll basically double the amount of data uh, from what had been collected to date. So that'll help improve the search precision or the measurement precision and, and searches. But then there's another shutdown and a much bigger upgrade called the high luminosity LHC upgrade coming up. And that will target a uh, pile up, um, sorry, luminosities uh, uh, at least uh, of order four times larger than we've uh, seen or will see uh, in the current LHC running. And the overall idea is over the coming years when that starts is to collect 10 times more data from what was collected or what will be collected over the next LHC run. So we'll get 10 times more data beyond what we get and finish by, uh, well, roughly 2025. Uh, this high luminosity LHC upgrade is set to start in 2027. Um, Probably don't have too much time to, to talk about this, but uh, for the run three, the one that starts next year, we are doing some work on the trigger system. I think I will just go briefly here. We're gonna extend the trigger system to look for muons which are not standard. <laughs> they don't seem to come from the collision point. They're displaced. They don't have to be as displaced as much as I show in this cartoon, but they could be possible uh, decays of new heavy long lived particles that decay the muons or muon like objects in the muon system. We've been kind of blind, at least for large um, uh, displacements, but we're building into our trigger system to look for those. Uh, but let me just move on um, from that. Uh, well, the one interesting thing here is in the electronics, we, we can deploy a neural network inside the FPGAs of our electronic processors. Uh, instead, let me focus on the high luminosity LHC detector upgrades to go with that high luminosity LHC accelerator upgrade. And basically, um, we need new systems. We need new detector systems with higher granularity to handle the unprecedented pileup and radiation that's going to result from the much larger intensity of collisions. Because we want to maintain the same sensitivity for these physics processes as we have now, maybe even improving it. But our conditions are going to be significantly worse, many more particles coming out. 
So we're upgrading all the different systems, the calorimeters, the tracking systems. We're adding a timing detector that's new, additional muon detectors, and we're refining the trigger and data acquisition system. And we're essentially, I would say canonically, we're building half of the experiment. Why are we doing that? Um, we're trying to improve on the Higgs coupling sensitivities. So after run three, this was a, a study done to project the precision of the couplings for different modes, Higgs to two photons, two Bs, two tails, or two muons. Interesting thing to note that since that report was done back in 2018, we've already reached that level of sensitivity on the Higgs to dimuons. We've seen uh, that measurement of 40%. So maybe we're actually gonna do root two better in the next run. But then with the high luminosity LHC, we should get down to percent level precision or a few percent on these different coupling modes and even and about to 10% on the Higgs to dimuon. So that's what um, HLHC will give us, but even more interesting, well, that's another aside. Uh, we won't see it in electrons. It's just not gonna be reachable to LHC. I can explain that to you in the questions. What's really interesting though also is we want to explore um, the Higgs self-coupling. So the Higgs boson or the Higgs field couples with itself. It's kind of unique to the Higgs uh, for the field to do that. Um, I mean, gluons do couple to other gluons, but they're different types of gluons. They have different charges. Uh, but the cross-section for this is much smaller than for single Higgs production and is not sensitive yet at the LHC. But the HLHC should be able to do it. And to do that, we'll get at the potential shape. It'll help us extract the lambda parameter, one of the parameters in that potential. And the HLHC can allow us to reach four standard deviation sensitivity for this di Higgs production and to, and to measure the production cross-section to about 40% precision. So we're really trying to get at that and see this feature of the Higgs field. Um, of course, you can do even better if you uh, go to, to even um, higher energies, which would mean even larger cross-sections perhaps. And so just maybe to end with, uh, because I think I've used up my time, just I'll just flash briefly, I guess. Um, the potential future circular collider. So what if you scaled up the LHC by a factor of five or more? Um, so this is a little cartoon. The LHC already being big at 27 kilometers gets expanded out to 100 kilometers to reach 100 TeV of order energy to explore the high energy frontier and produce lots of Higgs bosons. There are many, many challenges. Uh, can't talk, talk about them all here. Uh, one of them is that big ring, although I comment that Texas might have had a ring that size back in the 90s, uh, the super super collider. Uh, but there's huge numbers of challenges with the number of proton collisions and radiation. And then one of the favorites nowadays, uh, kind of dark horse in the race, is something called a muon collider. This would be a compact and innovative facility to incorporate the advantages of a high precision lepton collider, which I don't have time to talk about here, but also have the advantage of an energy frontier machine like that future Hadron Collider. Um, this is just a diagram of how you would accelerate muons and inject them into a collider ring and provide collisions. And the advantage is that a 100 TV proton collider is roughly equivalent to a muon collider of only 14 TV. Well, only, <laughs> it's still a lot of energy, but uh, it's much less energy. It makes it more compact and can fit in a smaller lab footprint. But it's literally a race against time, much like this talk. <laughs> Sorry, uh, muons decay in only 2.2 microseconds in their rest frame. So you've got to hurry up and accelerate them and collide them. And surprisingly, there's actually concern about neutrino induced radiation. So we have to see about mitigating that. And well, this is complex. It's not quite a shovel ready design. It's gonna need some more R&D, but this could be really interesting and promising. Um, and it's, uh, these and other colliders are in active discussion in the so-called snow mass process going on in the US to decide future high energy physics directions. And let me just say that these next generation machines and detectors are the challenges that the next generations of scientists now get to tackle. So we're gonna need those young scientists to come into the field. So let me just end here. Um, maybe I won't read all this. Uh, I've, uh, well, no evidence yet for new physics in um, some decays I showed you. We've looked uh, and found evidence for the Higgs boson coupling to dimuons, the level st three standard deviations. The LHC is being upgraded to 14 dV for next, next year. And there's a high luminosity upgrade for 2027 and after and also future colliders that are in active discussion. Um, I'll stop there. 
Okay, thank you, Darren. Uh, very nice talk. So we have some time for a few questions and we can drift to wine and cheese, virtual wine and cheese. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Andrew has his hand up. Okay, there's a nice question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so since you're seeing Higston Mew Mew, um, can you talk at all about limits on Higston Mew Tau, the flavor violating decay? Yeah, certainly we've um, we've looked for some of the lepton flavor violating decays, and then apologize, I don't have that in this talk. Um, but yeah, certainly we've there have been searches for I, I believe that and and other lepton fly, flavor violating decays. But I, I would have to go look up the, what the limit is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean that would be even more interesting, right? Right? Who ordered <laughs> lepton flavor violation in the Higgs decays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be pretty pretty interesting. So I see Matthew has a question. Uh, yes. So thank you, Darren. Uh, I noticed something on slide 50. Could you go back? Yeah, uh, probably better if I do it this way. Hold on. Oh, I have been here. Okay. 50. So is it just my imagination that in the electron channel, it seems like you have an excess at high mass? What's going on there? Yeah, so you're talking here on the left plot, you kind of have like these two data points out here, um, which are even kind of above on the, on the background subtractive plot. So um, that's probably giving rise to some of, you know, those are near the three TV, probably one of, probably uh, one or both of these bumps here on the limit plot to the right. Uh, so there is a, a bit of an excess there, but you notice that before it, there's a bit of a, a, a gap so, um, so it, you know, it's something to keep an eye on if they keep accumulating, that's the signature, especially in dielectrons, which actually get reconstructed in very narrow peaks at high mass. Um, but you always get these kind of effects when you get down to the last few events at the very end of your spectrums. And um, you just have to be careful getting too excited by a couple of events. You've got to see if they start piling up. With well, I, have to, I, I mean, I would comment too that when you have an exponential distribution like that, you have this long tail. And so the probability to have some events pop up in the tail is quite high, right? So some, somewhere out there going to the right on that plot, you would expect to see some events above and you have to sort of look collectively. And, and, and when the limits are set in this plot on the right, they try to take all that into account. Right. Yeah, I mean, I didn't explain a lot of these things uh, for the audience, but those wiggles, you know, you see these, this, uh, we, the colors of the Brazilian flag, if you like. Um, that's kind of what our expected limits would be, the dash line, and the green would be one standard deviation variance on the limits, and yellow, two standard deviations. So those bumps are at the level of two standard deviations, not quite yet the signature for something evidence or, or discovery of something. So, but you know, something you keep an eye on, but you're always going to have wiggles to some level like that. So I see Doug has a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, can you go back to, I guess, maybe your, your relatively, I forget which slide number it was, but where you show the, you show the line, you show the linear, you know, where the muon, the dimuon one fits in the context of the, uh, yeah. yeah, that, the, hold on. I went, you went fast. Went too fast. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, getting there. Next there. one. There we go. Yeah, that one. So, so I guess the question is, um, okay, so we're gonna refine the error bars on this as we get higher precision data and higher, higher, uh, uh, the higher luminosity and so on and so forth. Like, I assume, and maybe this is just a rhetorical question at this point, I assume the theorists have some ready explanation to trot out if there is, you know, if, if this muon point ends up being you know, just slightly above the linear extrapolation, there's some beyond standard model thing that people have ready to pull out that would explain that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I can answer that, um, uh, if one of the theorists would be able to explain that. Um, yeah, I think you, you would expect, I mean, if there's a deviation here from that dashed line, that's evidence for new physics, and it wouldn't be that hard to write down some effective theory that accommodates whatever measurement they come up with. Okay. Okay, thanks. But 
Yeah, I mean, for me, very naively, just looking to see if things are lepton universal or not, and we don't expect them to be, and so that was already, but we, we knew that much earlier on. <laughs> um, you can do the inverse, like you can, one, one interesting thing is trying to figure out the branching fractions to what you can measure, and then what's left over and whether there's, whether that adds up to something less than you expected, or, or the, at least what's left over is more than what you expected which could indicate there's other Higgs decays to other new particles that you just didn't know about. Could be supersymmetric particles or something. And so that would be interesting. Um, uh, that's kind of more collectively doing analysis and, and probably difficult, but you, do can, you can set limits doing so-called uh, invisible Higgs decay limits to try to figure out and constrain uh, Higgs decays to things you don't see. And, and that could also help constrain new physics. Okay, we have another question from, I don't know how to say the name, Sadakat, Sadakat? That's correct, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really informative. I'm, I just wanna start out that I'm very new to muon detectors and Higgs boson. So I have, um, along the way, I had a couple of questions to you. Okay. So uh, there are three ways that you can detect the muon detectors. So are you trying to, um, why there are like three? Are you trying to, uh, at the end, decide which one is more effective? Because I'm sure running in three different ways is going to cost more. And um, or like, are you, or do they have different speed? Or what's the whole idea behind running in three different ways? Yeah, you're talking about the different detectors, right? That's correct. Yeah. So let me let me just flash that again. Um, okay. So the real the, the one of the answers is. Or the main answer is it's different technologies for the different conditions and um, trying to optimize, if you like, the expense and design. So in the central region on the far left, these are the drift tubes, so these enormous uh, aluminum cover boxes, but deep inside they have a drift cell. Muon goes through and you measure the time it takes to collect the charge in a wire and using that velocity times time is distance, you know how far from the wire it is and you get the position. Okay. Um, that works for a low occupancy detector, meaning one muon at a time or, or no muons. In the end cap regions of, of the experiment, there's more probability to get muons which deflect just slightly from the beam axis and you could get more than <laughs> one muon in a, in a detector element. And so you need, a, a, if you like, a more granular device. And so the cathode strip chamber system for the end caps was designed kind of trying to be able to handle higher radiation levels, higher levels of muons and other particles, maybe knock on electrons going through it. And it's just a, uh, a different type of technology to work not only in that environment, but also um, the, with the timing. Uh, there's some, okay, it's probably a subtlety, but the, the amount of time it takes to collect charges in the drift tubes is much longer than for the cathode strip chambers. So again, it kind of opens up a time gate as well. You get, you know, you, you might get extra particles which would confuse you. So. You optimize the detectors for the regions you're populating. The last one, the resistive plate chamber system, that is in both barrel and, and, and end cap. And that was kind of your, your safety because there's something I wrote here, which I didn't elaborate on. They're all self-triggering. Meaning if a muon goes through one of these detectors, it can generate a signal that will cause the experiment to read itself out. We were not sure the systems would work, or at least let me put it this way. Maybe the designers of the muon systems weren't sure that us electronics people would be able to design a system that would self-trigger on these very slow drift tubes or this very, maybe somewhat more complicated cathode strip chamber system. So they put something, a simpler technology, resistive plate chambers. They're very fast. They can make sharp timing gates and we can just trigger with that. And then we can at least read out then the data from these slower detectors or more complicated detectors and then do fits, if you like, to the data offline. So this was like a safety to say, well, at least we can trigger on this, uh, the RPCs and the Atlas experiment has similarly uh, RPCs uh, and other detectors for just triggering purposes and, and the drift tubes for precision offline measurements. But it turns out we were very successful. We got all of these to participate in the trigger. So we use all three of them. But the barrel and end cap were optimized for those regions. The RPCs were kind of like a safety. That helps a lot to see a bigger picture. Thank you for explaining sure. that. Okay, and, so. um, oh, um, one more question that I had was: you said that you throw away ninety-nine point nine nine eight percent of the 
triggers, right, of the results. How right. long does it normally take for, for people to go through all the fine? Because the numbers that you mentioned were so, like it was a friction of a second for it to collect all the data and so much of the data. Does the computer do that or do people like um, scientists like we'll go through all of this and then have to throw away so much of information or yeah um maybe uh let me try to get to the slide ahead of you know. um so at the amount of data per beam crossing that we read out from the experiment we can only afford to write to storage about this 1000 hertz um so we have to choose the right events as you're saying um we have to uh hold the data in basically effectively memory, but buffers of different types. And we have only a certain amount of time to do so because, well, let's just put it this way, the more memory you buy, the more it costs. Uh, so they agreed on a certain length, which for the first level was only to hold the data for four microseconds. If we don't get a decision to keep or, or reject before then, then the data is lost anyway. So that was a constraint. It, we, that was just a design parameter. It was partly arbitrary, but it's an optimization roughly of money versus <laughs> processing time. We were, able to, we were able to make it. We're actually going to extend the four microseconds now to 12 for the, the high luminosity upgrade. Um, the other level, you're kind of limited by, again, uh, money, <laughs> how many computers or at least CPU cores you can afford. And then you've got to make sure since you're limited to about the thousand hertz for storage, you've got to make sure your algorithms don't take more than a certain average amount of time, uh, given that many CPU cores that you have, um, so you can keep up with the data. I don't know if that quite answers the question, but just try to convey what it is we're doing. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Pat, Pat Hardigan has a question. Yeah, hi there. Um, not being a particle physicist allows me to ask a completely off the wall wacky question. <laughs> okay. Or at least the, I, I think it does anyway. Um, so with the three generations of matter, I mean, is there any theoretical reason why there should be those? Is it related in any way that we have three spatial dimensions? I mean, I've heard of compactified dimensions and so forth. I mean, what should we, is, is, that, is, is that just a coincidence? Is there, how, what should we expect in the well, future? I, well, I can give you kind of my reply, which might be more experimental driven in some theory, and then maybe a theorist will chime in. But um, the three generations, so, uh, okay, that was, maybe I can go back as I'm talking, but that included also the neutrinos, uh, the neutral leptons. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, right. But let's say here, these neutrinos in the bottom part of this left diagram here, um, we know that there are only three generations of neutrinos that have a mass less than 45 GV. And the way we know that is we had an, an accelerator and experiments that studied uh, Z boson production. This is Z boson here uh, in E plus E minus collisions. And then we could study the decay of that effectively. And the decay implies that the, the Z boson has a finite lifetime, a delta T. And by the uncertainty principle, that means there's a delta E, an energy uncertainty because of that short lifetime uh, where the product is about H bar. We can effectively from the width and knowing how many things the Z can decay to, including these neutrinos, we can add it all up and we can actually measure how many generations of neutrinos and other particles with a mass less than half the Z by, um, looking at that width of the, of the, if you like the delta E measurement, more, more generations would be wider and a shorter lifetime. But when they did the fit, when that accelerator first started collecting significant data of the Z boson decays, we quickly learned that there were only three. Now that doesn't rule out that you couldn't have a fourth generation where all the particles have a mass more than half of the Z boson, then that, that constraint is alleviated. Um, but for anything less than half the Z mass, we, Z mass, we know there's only these three generations. Um, it turns out three generations is kind of the minimum you need if you want something known as CP violation uh, to take place where there's a, if you essentially a matter antimatter asymmetry. 
uh, in the universe. We, we know there's a matter bias in the universe. There's more matter and very little antimatter. Whether that's the same CP violation we see <laughs> in physics the case so far, that's probably debatable. But um, three is an interesting number of generations from that perspective. Whether there's more, we haven't seen experimentally, uh, and there's reasons for it for from zebos and decays. But like I said, there could be very heavy ones. But um, I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in. <laughs> I think that's a great answer. I just wanted to add that Pat, you don't have a monopoly on wacky questions. Leave some wacky questions for the rest of us, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm good at those, though. So Andrew, you had a question. Well, I can hold it till. Well, well I, you're I the only one with the hand raised right now. Oh, I see. I just wanted to ask about you. You mentioned passing triggerless uh, efforts to go triggerless. I didn't know if you wanted to add a bit to that. Oh, sure. Um, so, and that maybe touched on the early one of the earlier questions. Um, let's see if I can get uh, back to the trigger section quickly here. Um, yeah, maybe maybe here. So, I I just was trying to convince you that because we can't store all that data, we have to throw out the 99.998% of collisions or crossings at least um, because it's too much data. And that's because if I read out all of the data from the detectors and it's not really all of the data, um, we do some kind of suppression already. So it's a subset of what might be at least what we think measurable signals from the detectors, um, which is roughly a megabyte. Um, you know, we, 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 can, we can calculate that and we, we have a certain throughput and storage rate that we were aiming for so that we don't accumulate, you know, unreasonable amounts of log data. Um, but triggerless can solve it a different way. Maybe I can take 100% of the collisions, but I better not be writing out that one megabyte of raw data. I have to write out, um, well, uh, in, you know, one one thousandth of it. Right, so now that, that might be pretty extreme, but if, if I would just writing out dimuons data, you know, I have two four vectors. So, okay, I have in each case then uh, four, you know, double precision numbers or something like that. Okay, that's a small amount of data. If that's all I want to store, yeah, I can take a higher rate. So that's what I meant by triggerless. If you're writing out a very limited amount of data, uh, you can do that. Now, in that case, you're only gonna be analyzing dimuon data you're not gonna be able to see what else the detectors were doing in case something weird was found. But if you think you understand a certain physics topology well enough um, and it's good enough uh, publication quality, you can take a much higher rate. And, and, and what that lets you do, and I didn't really explain it, but you know, how we reduce the rate, but what that lets you do is take or effectively open up your physics acceptance um, to processes. So for example, and I, I, I won't bother trying to find the slide, but, um, when I said talked about looking for low mass Z prime bosons. So they might be sitting there at a few GV, maybe even hundreds of MeV. Um, there's too many things <laughs> at that energy range to write out. It's too much rate. Um, we have a sensitivity down to muons of about 20 some GeV each, uh, which is gonna be something more like 40 GV in mass. Um, and the reason being is we, we apply a momentum threshold on these particles. That's how we reduce the rate because I didn't explain how we reduce the rate. I just say we have to select what's interesting. But how do we do that? We say, okay, keep all the high momentum stuff, throw away the low momentum stuff. But if you can get around the restriction of the, of the data throughput and just say, I'm only gonna store muon data, then I can take a higher rate that lets me lower the threshold. So lower the momentum, and then I can let me probe lower masses. So that's the aim there for the trigger list designs. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn off the recording and we'll go, you know, sort of wine and cheese and formal at this point. People can keep asking questions if they want. People leave if you want. Uh, we're going to hang around for a while. Uh, but, but 